Well, hello again. Glad to see you today. Uh, I read the synopsis of my initial sermon I was going to read, uh, do today, which was going to debunk the idea that homosexuality is a sin, and where Jesus says you follow the traditions of men but forget the commandments of God. The commandments of God boil down are two things, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He says nothing about the, anything else. So if you readers digest the Bible, love God, love others. Like if you pare down the, the 12 steps, it's uh, worship God, clean house, serve others. That's 12 steps. Uh, turn to God, clean house, serve others. So I decided not to, Barb said, you'll be preaching to the choir, so I'd have to do this the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the psalm we, we read earlier, the, the Genesis and the Luke, all are from today's lectionary. And I have missed that over the, the last six months. Uh, Dale was very, my, my friend Dale, my, one of my, be, my best friend from college, and, and we served there two years, and he died back in July, for those of you who don't know the story. Died, and, and we stayed on. I felt like I needed to help the church transition. But we did psalms, and we did the lectionary, and it was, uh, was uh, kind of low high church, if you understand. And uh, so I like the way, though, the lectionary, this, especially on this day, in light of what's going on in St. Louis, uh, for met that will impact Methodists around the world. I treasure people who know what to say and when to say it. Jerry Clower used to tell a story about a professor of geology who was paid a hefty sum to go on a speaking tour of colleges and universities and so the oil company hired a driver to chauffeur him about. And so one day after a couple of months, the professor said to his driver, what do you think of my talks? He said, well, the driver said, well, to tell you the truth, at this point, I know your talk backwards and forwards. And furthermore, I think I could do a much better job of giving those talks than you. So the professor thought to himself, well, I'm gonna stop him from sucking eggs. So he said to him, tell you what, they don't know me by sight at this next town in this next college, and we're about the same size, so you pull over here, we'll exchange suits, I'll drive you up, and you can give the talk, and we'll see how that works out. And the driver said, well, you're on. <laughs> so the professor, they put on the black suit with the driver's hat, and the driver put on the blue serge suit of the professor. And boy, did he ever give a talk. He, as we used to say in the Baptist church, he shut the corn <laughs> right, down, right down to the stalk. He, they whooped and hollered at the end of his talk. They gave him a standing ovation and did something out of the ordinary that never happened, happened at that college. The organizer of the event was so taken, he says, well, we've got a few extra moments. How about we take some questions from the audience? <laughs> so, you know, he kind of, okay. The student stood up, very studious looking, horn rimmed, Coke bottle bottom glasses stood up about midway and said, Professor, let's suppose you're on a wildcat venture site and your drill hits solid rock after drilling for two miles. When the core of the bit of the drill is recovered, what will be the strata of earth you will have reached? And what will be the pH of the soil and the rock at the core of the bit? <laughs> well, what do you say? The driver chuckled a little bit and stalling for time. Then he said, Mr. Student, I'm surprised at how simple and stupid that question is. In fact, I'm surprised they'd let a student as uninformed as you get into this fine institution. And to show you how ignorant that question is, I'm gonna have my driver come up here and answer it for you. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Well, this is a big week for our denomination in so many ways. When, when people are opposed to one another, there are those who will look for win-win situations that in everything that I've been hearing over the last couple of years and in talks with friends and with Dale before he died and even after he's died, we talked. I fear that this general conference will only end in a lose-lose proposition. One side may win, but in the end we all will lose, if you get my meaning. And so for today, what do you do when you come face to face with your enemies? Those opposed to you or don't think like you? As my sermon asks, what do you say? I have added to the lectionary just one brief scripture out of Proverbs 25 that says, the right words at the right time, or the right word at the right time is like a custom made piece of jewelry. The right word at the, li at the right time is like a custom made piece of jewelry. Or as Virginia Satir would have said it, appropriate congruent communication is highly valuable. Appropriate, congruent communication is worth more than solid gold apples in a silver bowl. But given these circumstances, what do you say? Knowing what to say and when to say it is a skill acquired by much thought and experience. Having a good role model or 12 helps. On the other hand, just opening your mouth and letting her fly white, any nincompoop can do that. Sometimes answers seem so obvious. The children were at the front of the church for the children's sermon. And the minister posed a question to them. This is my favorite church story. Uh, <laughs> What is brown and gray with a bushy tail and hides nuts for the winter? And one little kid shot up her hand and said, he said, okay, what is it? He said, well, I know I'm supposed to say Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> and we could get very distracted knowing what it is we're supposed to say. Thank you. I'll, I'll be here all morning. <laughs> but Proverbs 25 talks about the right words at the right times, as opposed to the wrong words, I guess, at the wrong times. Or, as Satir would say it, incongruent mixed messages, where the intent and the content don't go together. As a, you might want to shield your ears, would say, for the last time I'm not mad. You know, the mixed messages we get so often. So how does one know what to say at any given moment? I recall my first experience of leading worship at a funeral was at age 12. I was to do the cold open for the service while my dad was on the way from the hospital to downtown. So what do you say? I began by leading in prayer. It seemed like the ministerial thing to do. And in a bouncy, lilting voice, I began, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Then I froze, thinking how, how inappropriate that may be. I had no context. I didn't know. It seemed it was incongruent. The family certainly wasn't in a light and happy mood, that's for sure. But the kind of pressure of not knowing what to say can make you toss and turn in your bed at night in the wee hours of the morning, what do you say? Maybe you've been on the receiving end of some of these gaffes. You've had people who in your struggles and in your heartache possibly say as they have to me, I know how you feel. So what do you say? Well, I usually think, well, no, you don't. I don't think you do. 
when my father died in May of 1999, it'll soon be 20 years, he was in the pulpit. He called me early that morning because he and my mom were coming up for the baccalaureate service at Metter High School. He was preaching at his home church over on Bull Street and he dropped dead mid-sermon. A lot of people filled the funeral home at Fox and Weeks. I mean, they were wrapped around the building a couple of times. Some well-meaning people said to me, he went the way he wanted to, didn't he? With his boots on or some other wild declaration of some kind of faith with the implication that it was fantastic, to which I wanted to scream, no! He wanted to be in Metter that Sunday night with his granddaughter and with us. But what do you say? Now don't get me wrong, there's a germ of truth in that that I can accept after the fact. And he may have even said that in a conversation or a sermon or in passing. It, Sometimes it's just too soon to hear those things. When our lovely grandson, John Ashley, died back in October, we were sorely grieving over and continue to grieve from time to time, but some well-intentioned people said at the funeral home, I'm sure John is rejoicing in his cancer-free body at this very moment. Now that may be true, but those aren't the right words. Or those may be the right words, it just wasn't the right moment. It's a truth I can resonate with, it just wasn't the right time. He was, John Ashley was a loving boy who showed us grace and strength. So what do you say? What do you say? Well, you say something like, well, I'm sorry for your loss. I know this must be hard. But not knowing what to say doesn't mean you're less than, that's okay. Sometimes, like in the incident where Joseph is conversing with his brothers, we get the idea that silence may be a, an appropriate response when you don't know what to say. Or instead of saying the wrong thing, just be quiet a while. So how will you and I respond to thoughtless, soulless, unloving, hateful, dare I say Methodists in the days ahead? What do you say? The Old Testament reading from Genesis 45 is set at the high point of Joseph's life, face to face with his haters. Another story in the Bible about family love that may remind you of Thanksgivings with your family, but in this part of the, because you have a lot of history, you know. The part that we read today, the cat gets the brother's tongue. I mean, they were in Egypt after all. It would be right that the cat get their tongue. They are speechless. And I feel a little uneasy going through this history here at Asbury because between Asbury and Broadway, we know the Joseph story pretty well. Joseph was a man well acquainted with grief and sorrow. He prized by his father, given a special coat. When you look at the Hebrew for what that coat of many colors was, many ways of interpreting the Hebrew there as a coat of many colors or a coat that went all the way to his feet or uh, an ornamented tunic or whatever it was with special color design or gold threading. It was just a coat that you wouldn't go working in. You wouldn't go post hole digging in this coat. It was a special coat. And I got that from Wikipedia, so you know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and from then on, he was despised by his brothers to the point they came up with their own plan. Sold into slavery. Made good with Potiphar. Would not make good with Potiphar's wife. He resisted all her advances and was summarily cast into prison. So Joseph, one who was familiar with betrayal and abuse and corruption, the ugliness of his own flesh and blood. Of course, they were half-brothers, mind you. I can only imagine the painful memories and the thoughts of retribution and revenge that must have haunted him over those years that would have landed him in AA today 
because of the deep-seated resentments he would have been holding in his heart of hearts. It would be enough to break most any person. But I came across this statement that in the last week or so that says, this, the same boiling water that can make a potato soft can make an egg hard. It just depends on the materials with which you're made. Well, Joseph was made of some sturdy stuff. And so were you. So are we. And Joseph makes it all the way to being Pharaoh's number two person in the land. And there we arrive at Genesis 45. Joseph says, it says in, in the scripture, they were too frightened to answer. They, the brothers were too frightened when they realized all of a sudden their life went on an instant replay. And they're seeing power in front of them. And they know what that means. They know what power can do. And they've probably seen retribution and revenge play out multiple times over. But then, in, light, in the face of their silence, Joseph continues. Don't worry or blame yourself for what you did. God is the one who sent me ahead of you to save lives. God sent me on ahead of you to keep your families alive. After all, you weren't really the ones who sent me. It was God. That lets me know that it seems that Joseph has worked through some kind of process. He's done a lot of processing about his events. And he's prayed about it. He's talked about it. He's gotten feedback. Possibly in spiritual insight for himself that God has revealed to him. But how does one get to a place of health spiritually and mentally? Carolyn Yoder wrote a book called The Little Book of Trauma Healing, and she presents a process of trauma healing that she calls breaking the cycles, where you find safety. Well, he found safety in a group of Ishmaelites. He got away from those guys wanting to kill him. You find safety where you can. Through mourning and grieving, and I'm sure he did a lot of that too, a lot of tears, and because the tears come back when he's reunited. It says that he hugged his brother Benjamin, who was his full flesh and blood, weeping. And then it says that he wept over each one of those brothers. You accept the reality of the loss, which is like the fifth stage of grieving that Catherine Kubler Ross wrote about. Acceptance. Reflecting and understanding the enemy story, looking at the other person, trying to understand what's the backstory for them, because everybody's got one. Everybody's got a story. Committing to take risks, learning tolerance and coexistence, engaging the offender. Well, that's Genesis 40, 45 all over again. Being willing to engage them in dialogue, choosing to forgive. See, I don't think it's necessarily mandatory, but it's a choice we make. It's a choice we make. J Jesus offers it as a great choice. And then other steps towards the possibility of reconciliation. Whatever it was that enabled Joseph to speak the right word at the right time, he was prepared. At first, the brothers were speechless, like, like we said. But practicing being present is always, and being present and quiet is a wonderful skill to harness. So when you don't know what to say, what do you say? Well, maybe nothing, and that's okay. Being present with people means more than anyone can ever tell you. Later on, after hearing Joseph reframe their experience in the light of God's grace, something changed inside these brothers. As the Living Bible puts it, they found their tongues. Joseph's words were a real comfort. A reframing of events, barring that word that Billy used last Sunday, reframing the events, they were powerful words of healing, hope, and forgiveness. And it enabled these brothers to also use congruent communication. We don't know what they said, but I know oh, I can imagine. 
Reframing was made possible by Joseph's having worked through his issues. Others may call it paradigm shifting. Uh, Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits talk, calls it a paradigm shift. He talks about being on the subway in Manhattan years ago and it's early Sunday morning and he's in town and a man and his five children get on the subway and sit down near him. So the kids were just out of control. They were all over the place bumping into people, loud, obnoxious, and this father seemed totally oblivious to what was going on. Finally, when he had had about enough of it, he went over to the man and said, Sir, can, can you do anything about your kids? They're, they really are disruptive. It's was like he woke up out of a trance and he said, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm not even thinking right. You see, we, we just came from the hospital. Their mother died this morning, and I guess they don't know what to do, and I don't know what to do either. See how a paradigm can shift in just a moment. And that's what happens to these brothers. These brothers, Joseph reframes their behavior with a declaration that says, you intended this. To look at what God has done with this. You meant it for harm. God meant it for good. Joseph informs the family that God used the events for redeeming the entire family and giving everyone a future. What a word of hope. Joseph gives us a great example of how the right word at the right time is like a custom-made piece of jewelry. So come this Tuesday. Our church, United Methodist Church at large, may be split, even more so. Some will rejoice, maybe. Others will be hurt. No one will win. My challenge to us that if it doesn't go our way, that we will still be in a place where we can say the right thing at the right time. So I'll leave you with an idea of what to say from Jesus' own paradigm shifting that Grady read earlier. You ready? Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you not the worst. And when someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Here's a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, and then grab the initiative and do it for them. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So how are we going to treat the haters that are not like us, who, who don't even like us? Especially if we are on the winning side or if our way does not prevail. Jesus says that if you love those who love you, how is that different from how the ungodly treat each other? Even the lowest of the low, Jesus says, treat each other that way. So as Chris Rock would say, what do you want, a cookie? The truth is, the best results won't be in what we say, but in what we do. The best results won't be in what we say, but in what we do. Are you ready to live generously? It won't be easy. Jesus' way rarely is easy. It's often hard. So grab the initiative and do for them what you'd like done for you. What do you say? In the name of God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.